Welcome to the Enchanted Library, where we turn the pages of books, beautiful and old, living and magical. It's time to curl up, get cozy, and join us on an adventure. Today we're starting into a new book called The Wonder Book for Boys and Girls by Nathaniel Hawthorne. Introduction. Tanglewood Porch. Beneath the porch of the country seat called Tanglewood, one fine autumnal morning, was assembled a merry party of little folks, with a tall youth in the midst of them. They had planned a nutting expedition, and were impatiently waiting for the mists to roll up the hill slopes, and for the sun to pour the warmth of the Indian summer over the fields and pastures, and into the nooks of the many-colored woods. There was a prospect as a fine a day as ever gladdened the aspect of this beautiful and comfortable world. As yet, however, the morning mist filled up the whole length and breadth of the valley, above which, on a gently sloping eminence, the mansion stood. This body of white vapor extended to within less than a hundred yards of the house. It completely hid everything beyond that distance, except for a few ruddy or yellow treetops, which here and there emerged, and were glorified by the early sunshine, as was likewise the broad surface of the mist. Four or five miles off to the southward rose the summit of Monument Mountain, and seemed to be floating on a cloud. Some fifteen miles farther away in the same direction appeared the loftier dome of Taconic, looking blue and indistinct, and hardly so substantial as the vapory sea that almost rolled over it. The nearer hills, which bordered the valley, were half submerged, and were speckled with little cloud wreaths all the way to their tops. On the whole, there was so much cloud and so little solid earth that it had the effect of a vision. The children, above mentioned, being as full of life as they could hold, kept overflowing from the porch of Tanglewood, and scampering along the gravel walk, or rushing across the dewy herbage of the lawn. I can hardly tell how many of these small people there were, not less than nine or ten, however, no more than a dozen, of all sorts, sizes, and ages, whether girls and boys. They were brothers, sisters, and cousins, together with a few of their young acquaintances, who had been invited by Mr. and Mrs. Pringle to send some of this delightful weather with their own children at Tanglewood. I am afraid to tell you their names, or even to give them any names with other children have ever been called by, because, to my certain knowledge, authors sometimes get themselves into great trouble by accidentally giving the names of real persons to the characters in their books. For this reason, I mean to call them Primrose, Periwinkle, Sweet Fern, Dandelion, Blue Eye, Clover, Huckleberry, Cowslip, Squash Blossom, Milkweed, Plantain, and Buttercup, although to be sure such titles might better suit a group of fairies than a company of earthly children. It is not to be supposed that these little folks were to be permitted by their careful fathers and mothers, uncles, aunts, or grandparents to stray abroad into the woods and fields without the guardianship of some particularly grave and elderly person. Oh, no, indeed. In the first sentence of my book, you will recollect that I spoke of a tall youth standing in the midst of the children. His name, and I shall let you know his real name, because he considers it a great honor to have this told the stories that are here to be printed— his name was Eustace Bright. He was a student at Williams College, and had reached, I think at this period, the venerable age of 18 years, so he felt quite like a grandfather towards Periwinkle, Dandelion, Huckleberry, Squash Blossom, Milkweed, and the rest, who were only half or a third as venerable as he. A trouble in his eyesight, such as many students think it necessary to have nowadays to prove their diligence at their books, had kept him from college a week or two after the beginning of the term. But, for my part, I have seldom met with a pair of eyes that looked as if they could see farther or better than those of Eustace Bright. This learned student was slender and rather pale, as all Yankee students are, but yet of a healthy aspect, and as light and active as if he had wings to his shoes. By the by, being much addicted to wading through streamlets and across meadows, he had put on cowhide boots for the expedition. He wore a linen blouse, a cloth cap, and a pair of green spectacles, which he had assumed, probably, less for the preservation of his eyes than for the dignity they imparted to his countenance. 
In either case, however, he might as well have let them alone, for Huckleberry, a mischievous little elf, crept behind Eustace as he sat on the steps of the porch, snatched the spectacles from his nose, and clapped them on her own. And as the student forgot to take them back, they fell off into the grass and lay there till next spring. Now, Eustace Bright, you must know, had won great fame among the children as a narrator of wonderful stories. And although he sometimes pretended to be annoyed, when they teased him for more and more and always for more, yet I really doubt whether he liked anything quite so well as to tell them. You might have seen his eyes twinkle, therefore, when Clover, Sweet Fern, Cowslip, Buttercup, and most of their playmates besought him to relate one of his stories while they were waiting for the mist to clear up. "'Yes, Cousin Eustace,' said Primrose, who was a bright girl of twelve, with laughing eyes and a nose that turned up a little. "'The morning is certainly the best time for stories, of which you so often tire out our patience. "'We shall be in less danger of hurting your feelings by falling asleep at the most interesting points, "'as little Cowslip and I did last night.' "'Naughty Primrose!' cried Cowslip, a child of six years old. "'I did not fall asleep.' and I only shut my eyes as to see a picture of what Cousin Eustace was telling about. His stories are good to hear at night, because we can dream about them asleep, and good in the morning, too, because then we can dream about them awake. So I hope he will tell us one this very minute. Thank you, my little cowslip, said Eustace. Certainly you shall have the best story I can think of, if it were only for defending me so well from that naughty primrose. But, children, I have already told you so many fairy tales that I doubt whether there is a single one which you have not heard at least twice over. I am afraid you will fall asleep in reality if I repeat any of them again. No, 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 cried Blue Eye, Periwinkle, Plantain, and half a dozen others. We like a story all the better for having heard it two or three times before. And it is a truth, as regards children, that a story seems often to deepen its mark in their interest, not merely by two or three, but by numberless repetitions. But Eustace Bright, in the exuberance of his resources, scorned to avail himself of an advantage with an older storyteller would have been glad to grasp at. It would be a great pity, said he, if a man of my learning, to say nothing of original fancy, could not find a new story every day, year in and year out, for children such as you. I will tell you one of the nursery tales that was made for the amusement of our great old grandmother, the Earth, when she was a child in frock and pinafore. There are a hundred such. It is a wonder to me that they have not long ago been put into picture books for little boys and girls. But instead of that, old gray-bearded grandsires pore over them in musty volumes of Greek and puzzle themselves with trying to find out when and how and for what they were made. "'Well, well, well, Cousin Eustace,' cried all the children at once. "'Talk no more about your stories, but begin.' "'Sit down, then, every soul of you,' said Eustace Bright, "'and all be as still as so many mice.' At the slightest interruption, whether from great naughty Pimrose, little Dandelion, or any other, I shall bite the story short off between my teeth, and swallow the untold part. But, in the first place, do any of you know what a Gorgon is? I do, said Primrose. Then hold your tongue, rejoined Eustace, who would rather she had known nothing of the matter. Hold all your tongues, and I shall tell you a sweet pretty story of a Gorgon's head." And so he did, as you may begin to read on the next page. Working up his sophomorical tradition with a great deal of tact, and incurring great obligations to Professor Anthon, he, nevertheless, disregarded all classical authorities whenever the vagrant audacity of his imagination impelled him to do so. The Gorgon's Head Perseus was the son of Danae, who was the daughter of a king. And when Perseus was a very little boy, some wicked people put his mother and himself into a chest and set them afloat upon the sea. The wind blew freshly and drove the chest away from the shore, and the uneasy billows tossed it up and down, while Danae clasped her child closely to her bosom, and dreaded that some big wave would dash its foamy crest over them both. The chest sailed on, however, and neither sank nor was upset, until, when night was coming, it floated so near an island that it got entangled in a fisherman's nets, and was drawn out high and dry upon the sand. The island was called Seraphis, and it was reigned over by King Polydectes, who happened to be the fisherman's brother. 
This fisherman, I am glad to tell you, was an exceedingly humane and upright man. He showed great kindness to Danae and her little boy, and continued to befriend them until Perseus had grown to be a handsome youth, very strong and active, and skillful in the use of arms. Long before this time, King Polydectes had seen the two strangers, the mother and her child, who had come to his dominions in a floating chest. As he was not good and kind, like his brother the fisherman, but extremely wicked, he resolved to send Perseus on a dangerous enterprise, in which he would probably be killed, and then to do some great mischief to Danae herself. So this bad-hearted king spent a long while in considering what was the most dangerous thing that a young man could possibly undertake to perform. At last, having hit upon an enterprise that promised to turn out as fatefully as he desired, he sent for the useful Perseus. The young man came to the palace and found the king sitting upon his throne. Perseus, said King Polydectes, smiling craftily upon him, you are grown up a fine young man. You and your good mother have received a great deal of kindness from myself, as well as from my worthy brother the fisherman, and I suppose you would not be sorry to repay some of it. Please, your majesty, answered Perseus, I would willingly risk my life to do so. Well then, continued the king, still with a cunning smile on his lips, I have a little adventure to propose to you, and as you are a brave and enterprising youth, you will doubtless look upon it as a great piece of good luck to have so rare an opportunity of distinguishing yourself. You must know, my good Perseus, I think of getting married to the beautiful Princess Hippodamia, and it is customary on these occasions to make the bride a present of some far-fetched and elegant curiosity. I have been a little perplexed, I must honestly confess, where to obtain anything likely to pre please a princess of her exquisite taste. But this morning, I flatter myself, I have thought of precisely the article. And can I assist your majesty in obtaining it? cried Perseus eagerly. You can, if you are as brave a youth as I believe you to be, replied King Polydectes, with the utmost graciousness of manner. The bridal gift which I have set my heart on presenting to the beautiful Hippodamia is the head of the Gorgon Medusa with the snaky locks, and I depend on you, my dear Perseus, to bring it to me. So, as I am anxious to settle affairs with the princess, the sooner you go in quest of the Gorgon, the better I shall be pleased. I will set out tomorrow morning, answered Perseus. Pray do so, my gallant youth, rejoined the king. And Perseus, in cutting off the Gorgon's head, be careful to make a clean stroke so as not to injure its appearance. You must bring it home in the very best condition, in order to suit the exquisite taste of the beautiful Princess Hippodamia. Perseus left the palace, but was scarcely out of hearing before Polydectes burst into a laugh, being greatly amused, wicked king that he was, to find out how readily the young man fell into the snare. The news quickly spread abroad that Perseus had undertaken to cut the head of Medusa with the snaky locks. Everybody was rejoiced, for most of the inhabitants of the island were as wicked as the king himself, and would have liked nothing better than to see some enormous mischief happen to Danae and her son. The only good man in this unfortunate island of Seraphis appeared to have been the fisherman. As Perseus walked along, therefore, the people pointed after him, and made mouths, and winked to one another, and ridiculed him as loudly as they dared. Ho, ho, they cried, Medusa's snakes will sting him soundly. Thank you for joining us today. If you enjoyed today's episode, please leave a review on your favorite podcast platform and share our podcast with a friend. Visit our website at www.enchantedlibrary.net to see our past books or to connect with us on Facebook. If you'd like to support the work we do, you can visit our Patreon page at patreon.com slash enchantedlibrary. We appreciate your support. Until next time, friends, happy reading. <laughs>